got another exam question walkthrough for A-level chemistry. So this is number 20 in the transition elements playlist. The question covers the general properties of the transition elements, some reactions, complex ions, and the construction of a redox equation. The question is suitable for all of the major exam boards and if you haven't already subscribed to the channel I'd really love you to do that because it really helps me out. As always the link to the questions in the description of the video if you want to try it first. Okay so we'll make a start. So the first thing I'm doing is describing what's meant by a D block element. Now obviously there's lots to choose from here. I've gone for iron so all you would need to say is that it's in the D block because it's highest energy electron is in a D subshell. And because I've gone for iron, I'm given its electron configuration. Now, for the case of the 4s2 and 3d6, I could have written those either way around. Just be careful if you go for chromium or copper, remember they're a little bit unusual because they have the 4s1 configuration. The chromium will be 4s1, 3d5. Copper's 4s1, 3d10. Next thing I'm going to explain is what is meant by a transition element. So they form at least one ion with an incomplete D subshell. So because I've gone for iron uh, as my example at the start, I've just gone for iron 2 plus and I've written out its electron configuration. Remember, it's the 4s electrons are lost first when the transition elements form their ions. And then finally, explain why some D-block elements are not transition elements. Well, that's scandium and zinc. So we just need to explain why scandium forms a 3-plus ion only. There's its electron configuration. And we just need to say something like the 3D subshell is empty. And then for zinc, it forms the 2-plus ion only. There's its electron configuration. And we just need to say the 3D subshell is full. So we're moving on to part B now and the reactions. We'll start with the precipitation reactions. I'll do copper and chromium, but obviously I've got copper's reactions on the screen at the moment. Um, so there's a couple of options we can go for. We can either go for the precipitation of copper two plus with aqueous hydroxide ions, and we're gonna get copper two hydroxide, which is a, a blue precipitate, pale blue precipitate to be exact, but pale's not required. Uh, you could have gone for the reaction with aqueous ammonia there, uh, but the equation's a bit more complicated, so I've just kept it as simple as possible. The alternative reaction you could have gone for with copper is the reaction with aqueous iodide ions, and that gives a white precipitate of copper 1 iodide and a brown solution of iodine. So in my opinion, this first one is the easiest one to go for. And here's the chromium example, just in case you went for that option. So I've gone for the simplest version of the equation. So it's chromium 3 plus ions with 3 hydroxide ions, giving CrOH3, which is a green precipitate, or technically it's grey-green in colour, but green is totally fine. Again, you could have gone for the reaction with aqueous ammonia, uh, which still gives the same precipitate, but uh, the equation's a bit more complicated. Now moving on to the ligand substitution reactions. So I've written up the copper ones first. So the easiest one in my opinion is this one here. So that's the aqueous copper two plus ion, but we've got to use the full formula now. So we're showing the six water ligands. So that reacts with four moles of Cl minus ions. And you get this complex here, which is a yellow solution. And obviously the six water ligands have been substituted by those four chloride ligands. The other one you could have gone for is the ligand substitution of uh, copper hexaqua 2 with excess ammonia. So we put four moles of ammonia into the equation and basically two of the um, water ligands are left in and four of them are substituted with the ammonia ligands. And that's a deep blue solution and you would have to specify the deep and finally, the chromium examples, just in case you've gone for those. So either of these is fine, um, but they both involve the reaction of the hexa-aqua 3 plus ion with an excess of either ammonia or an excess of hydroxide ions. So in the case of the ammonia reaction, 
you get this complex ion here which has a purple color so that'll be a purple solution in the case of the excess hydroxide ions you get this complex ion here and that's a green solution Moving on to part C, so we've got this complex of cobalt-3 and it contains two ethane dioate ligands and two water ligands. So I've just written the charges of the three parts underneath, so obviously cobalt-3 is 3 plus, uh, two ethane dioate ligands would be 2 times the 2 minus, the charge was given there, and obviously water is neutral. So the overall charge for this complex is going to be 3 plus and 4 minus, one minus and then moving on to the coordination number of the cobalt in the complex so remember coordination number is the number of coordinate bonds going to the central uh, transition metal ion so the two bidentate ligands are going to be forming two coordinate bonds each so there'll be four coming from that and obviously water is a monodentate ligand so they would be putting one each so obviously the total there is six and the final part of the question, construction of the overall equation for this redox reaction. The easiest way, I think, to do this is to do the two separate parts and then combine to create the overall reaction. So we're told that Cr2072- minus is converted into Cr3+, plus, and the V3 plus ions are converted into VO2 one plus ions. So let's build up the two half equations. So the first thing we need is a two in front of the chromium. And now we'll look at the oxygens. So we're only allowed to balance with uh, water. And because this is acidified conditions, H plus ions. So I'm gonna put the waters in next. I've got seven O's on the left. So I need seven H2O's on the right. That's introduced hydrogen. So I'm gonna put 14 moles of H plus on the left. Now I look at the overall charge left and right and balance it with electrons. So we've got 2 minus 14 plus, so 12 plus on this side, 6 plus on this side. So I need to get this side from 12 plus down to 6 plus, so I need 6 electrons. So we'll do exactly the same for the vanadium half equation. So we've got two oxygens on the right, so if I put two H2Os, on the left, there's two oxygens. That's introduced four H's essentially, so I need four H pluses on the right. Overall charge left and right now, so we've got three plus and five plus. So I need to bring five plus down to three plus, so I'll put two electrons on the right. And now the final part of the process is to combine the two half equations so that the electrons will disappear. So you basically you want the same number of electrons left and right. So you can see we've got six electrons on this half equation and we've got only two in this one. So we're gonna multiply the vanadium one by three. And when we add it together, we get all of this here, which we must then simplify. So I'm going to cancel out the H pluses so I've got 12 on the right, so they're gonna disappear, and that would go down to two. And in terms of the water, I've got six on the left, but seven on the right. So those six will go, and that seven will go down to one. So that there, messy as it is, is the final answer. And it didn't feel right leaving it a total mess, so I've tidied it up there.